he comes to us highly decorated, but kind of in a different vein than I think a lot of us are used to. So uh, currently, Dario is serving as Chris at large um, at McCormick here at Northwestern, though he uh, lives in Houston um, and uh, is uh, represents the Inman Gallery there. He also has a number of other uh, recognitions and awards that I won't have time to list them all. Uh, you can find them online if you so choose, but I wanted to highlight uh, one thing, which was that in 2015, uh, Dario was on a team of scientists that were uh, consulting a breakthrough message for uh, SETI, right? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, uh, I know not 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 necessarily something that we're all too familiar with, but definitely relevant to synthetic biology. I think, right? Um, and trying to figure out the best ways that we can communicate that that information to the public. So, um, he's also served uh, as an artist in residence for a number of different universities. I think MIT, uh, Bard College, Indigenous in Northwestern, um, a 2004 International Association of Art Critics Award uh, for Best Exhibition. A commercial gallery and so on and so forth and I'm not going to take up any more of the time and I'll let you do that so thank you so much for uh, coming here to share uh, your work with us today. Thanks for having me. So yeah I'm very excited to be here just a little more background so uh, McCormick's School of Engineering which part of of course and the Block Museum have been brainstorming a way to get a visual artist or someone in the fine arts to engage with with the campus more broadly, but then of course engineering more specifically. So I'm, I'm, I've been here several times over the past year. This is my longest stretch of, this. I'm entering my fourth week, and I've, been, I've already I've given a lecture in sound studies. to collaborate and, and, and have a discussion with the bioethics department, which is another interest of mine in bioethics. So I'm kind of here to be a facilitator, which I hope I can break open a bit today too, what you may think an artist is or how they function in the world. I, I make things, I love, I love to make things, but that's only part of what I do as an artist. Uh, in a similar way as you are a, a laboratory practice, of course, but you're also thinkers in the world that uh, contribute to a broader cultural understanding of the human condition. And in that way, that's, the artists do something very similar. So that's kind of a little, I'll be happy to tell you more about what's going on that, that your dean is the one getting this off the ground. We can talk about that a little later. But just a little more background, I'm from, uh, I live in Houston, I'm from San Antonio. I was a biology major, switched to art. Uh, it never once occurred to me to not bring the science with me as an artist. And so much of my practice deals with collaborations across different scientific disciplines. And why? Because historically this was not always the case. And you know, Da Vinci is the obvious example, but there are many others. And so what, what, what sort of propelled us to start to divide uh, knowledge production into these, what I think are pretty kind of tidy illusions that are necessary for our fields to advance, of course, but I think we lose something when we forget how we're being creative and thinking in various fields. And so my, my goal has always been to circle back those two domains, specifically art and science. And not just to sort of give a lip service, but to really make the case that the science can change in a way that it may have not changed otherwise, and the art will as well. But I don't want it to be a, you know, we're kind of patting each other on the back and moving on. I, I'm for a really deep engagement. So this, uh, I, I, I like to say this, I really thought, like, what was that seed that, that we both, I would argue, originated from? And there, there are many, but if I had to really boil it down, it's this, it's that we are both in the business at some level of increasing the sensitivity of our observations. And if you can do that as a scientist, <coughs> science is going to advance. And I would argue if you can do it as an artist and a poet, which actually, of course, is a much older discipline of engaging with the world, you're going to advance art as well. So I like to remind us that even to this day, we still have this in common. 
And this is a good place to sort of think about how we can talk to each other. And so just to twist our disciplines a little, I like, I like, I like to think this way. How can an artist become a living Hubble telescope and emoting Large Hadron Collider? How can a scientist become the Emily Dickinson of data, the Passy Klein of experiment design? And as odd as that sounds, I like, I like it to be a little odd because it's bringing a different sensibility to the way we think about things. And this is something I, I very, very much believe, which is the scientific inquiry into physical reality is not in tension with art and the poetic. In fact, it's the opposite. Science that doesn't embrace its poetic and emotional dimensions, and art that doesn't grasp the beauty and enchantment of scientific understanding are both impoverished in the process. And I, I really believe that I hope I can kind of make that case today. So I'm really curious about how we all get you know, to, to, to be a scientist, to be an artist, the particular paths in life. And they're, they're driven by, of course, dedication and commitment and passion. And I like to think about where does, where does that come from in each of us? I'm sure everybody has an interesting story about how you got here and why are you focusing on this particular thing in life of all the things you can focus on. So I wanted to share with you a story that, that I can say that this is how it happened for me. And it really is a blending of art and science and was a transformative moment that showed me what, I just, what I'm saying here, which is how these two disciplines are deeply intertwined. And so I like to write a lot of questions. I'm a big uh, question writer. And so I'm going to throw a few questions out today. They're going to be a little odd, and that's my point, is they're a little poetically askew, I would argue. So my this is my big question that I've been uh, working on for many years now. How did the sound recording of the electrical signatures of a human heartbeat and brain waves in love end up heading for the other side of the solar system? Very strange question to ask, like how, why, how is this even a thing? But I wanna, it, I hope you're familiar, but I'd love to introduce you if not to what my by far favorite space mission ever, ever launched, the, the Voyagers, uh, launched in the late 70s, and they are incredible. I mean, basically what what we know about our outer planets, it was because of the Voyagers. Uh, other probes have now advanced that knowledge, but this is really what, what got us uh, to a better understanding. And because it was, it was only designed the last five years, five-year mission, and because it was on a trajectory no probe had ever been put on before, which was could it visit every outer planet on one trip? It was a rare once in 175 year alignment of the outer planets. And NASA designed it so that it was basically slingshotting, circling, studying, and slingshotting onto the next. But because they knew at the time that it was on this course, it would actually have the capability of breaking free of the gravitational pull of the sun, meaning it may be one of, if not the only, human-made object to actually leave our solar system. This is a very rare, rare event, very, very rare case. And, and they did it. And it, uh, I'm going to unwind the story a little more, but I want to tell you, um, as a little boy, I happened to stay homesick from school one day, and I heard this incredible, I was first, first grade probably, there was an incredible program on TV telling about this mission. And but what the gist of the mission, I mean, what the gist of the, the news program was about, actually, was not so much about the science, but it was that the public could call in a 1-800 number and hear something that, in my little boy, very ill state of mind, comparably misconstrued. I Because they were speaking about something about sounds of space or sounds sent to space. <clears throat> And in my mind, I thought they meant we had made contact. Mm -hmm. And that NASA was releasing a 1 800 number that we could all call and hear the first hello or whatever, I don't know. Um, so I called my mother with incredible excitement. I told her the whole story in great detail. And I said, Mom, I got to call this number. And as any you know, worried mom would be, she told me, Do not call that number. <laughs> 
because I don't who knows what actually, but you know, it's a one eight hundred number and who knows. So I waited all day for her to get home. Uh, it's very uh, stressful, like anxiety driven day. And as soon as she got home, I, I met her at the back door and I put the phone in her hand and I told her, make the call. And she called it. And after building up all day this excitement about, okay, this is it, we're gonna know. Um, I cannot tell you how disappointed I was <laughs> with what I actually heard. But I wanna unfold the story a little because with time I realized that it was actually the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. And it has a deep connection to biology and, uh, and art that I wanna tell you more about. So as, as the years passed, I was I became literally obsessed with this thing. Like, what the hell was this thing? Which I'll play for you in just a second. There are many, many things on board, but there's this one particular weird section where it's very staticky. And I just could not understand why NASA would do this. Why would they send this particular thing? Uh, they even released it to the public on CD. It was there the day the records started open, bought the CD, looking at the track listing, and this, mysteriously, this is all it says, life science. And this did nothing to satisfy my curiosity, because how was that a life sign, which didn't sound like a life sign, and what, what life sign, and whose was it, and you know, a whole host of questions. So this set me on a, again on a path, and I want to tell you what they actually were. I've since learned much more about them. So attached to the side of the probe, which you may know, I hope, if not, I hope you'll remember, I've spent much of my life studying this document. It's called the Golden Record. And because they knew that the Voyager was going to exit the solar system, they had asked Carl Sagan to put a team together and design an interstellar message to be placed on board just in case anything happened upon it. Um, you know, this is 1977, the medium of the era was a record, and they literally made a record of gold. And beautiful stories to tell you. I can go on and on. It just, just want to give you an idea of at an engineering level. You know, not only are you tasked with the content of what to say, you and roughly given an hour to have storage capacity to tell the whole story of what we were. But they also needed to make a device, uh, an object that could survived one billion years. That was the state of gold. That dwarfs any archival project humans have ever attempted. And this is the cover of it, which has these beautiful inscriptions that hopefully, there's a lot of ifs here, as, you, as I tell you more, you know, something needs to figure out how to build a record player, which is a huge, well, it needs to be found, which is a, highly improbable. Something needs to figure out a record player, highly improbable. Something needs to be able to decipher those codes to know, to sort of get a clue of what the content inside of it is. It's kind of the Rosetta Stone for it. Anyway, there's so many stories I can tell you. Here's just a small sampling of what they did on board. There's language, there's music, there's sounds of the natural world. There are uh, 118 analog encoded images, all with such really beautifully profound stories to tell. One of my favorites is this one. Uh, I know it may be hard to see from here, but what I love is that because they had limited storage capacity, everything had to be packed with link action in one image. Same thing with, I don't know, I don't know anybody who drinks water like this, um, but they're trying to exaggerate things about us to convey this biological information. And, you know, so I always love the images because in the quest to be clear to an unknown intelligence, they made us very weird to ourselves in these images. So, Wonderful stories to tell, but I want to fine tune back on that strange recording I heard and tell you the story behind it and why it's so important to my practice as an artist. But uh, my name is Andrea, young 27 year old writer who was asked to be part of the team. And I really believe that not only do I think the Golden Record is perhaps the greatest work of art that art history has not really accounted for, but I would argue that what I did on the mission is as much art as it is science. And she did something truly beautiful, and it's not as widely known, which is, as, as her, the team's working on the record, uh, her and Carl, secret, Carl Sager, they secretly 
fell in love and got engaged while they were working on the album. And remember, this is a very dramatic task. I hope that's been clear. Maybe the final document of our planet, really, maybe the final thing, because of this getting out of our solar system. And everybody knows that every day they're coming to work with this on their shoulders. This may be it. What the hell do we say? It's got to be the right thing and important. But what Ian did is is beautiful and not as widely known, which is. Just a few days removed from, get, from this incredible moment in her life, falling in love, getting engaged to Carl. She asked Carl this beautiful question. She asked him, did he think some future technology may have the technological capability to decipher the electricity of her body in her heart and her, and her brain and turn it back into whatever she was thinking about? And this, this is a crazy, this is crazy, you know? Uh, as I like to say, another way of saying that is, she was saying, can aliens read my mind? If you say it that way, it's got a very different connotation than the way I just, the previous way I said it. <laughs> but you know, Carl told her very beautifully, he said a billion years is a long time, so why don't we try? So she made an appointment at Bellevue Hospital in New York, and for one hour, she sat alone in a dark room, she recorded, her EKG, her EEG, and she just thought. And no, she's never fully revealed the hour of what she thought about, which is partly what I'm working to uncover. After they were married for 20 years, they had two children, she got the life that she, she hoped until he passed away. Uh, of course, she didn't know that at the time, but what she did that she revealed after Carl passed away is what? I would really argue is, is one of the great works of art that really merges science and art in a fascinating way. She made a mental itinerary of important events, places, things to think about, but she allowed herself a few minutes at the end of the recording to specifically think about falling in love and the life she hoped was ahead for them. And in all the discussions about what to put on board, one of the more difficult things to talk about was how do you represent human emotions on board as a thing that once existed in the universe. And how you do that at the level of biology, um, because this was, it was still it was a scientific mission, and so they, it started to be sort of couched under this, this, this umbrella of science, which technically it is. This is the physiology of her body and the electricity. But that's why it said life science, and why I finally realized after all these years why they have sort of all this uh, kind of uh, illusion about it. Because she couldn't just come out and say that's what she had done, because that would have been just way out there for, you know, again, science and tradition. And so I really believe this is a bit of a subversive artwork, in that she literally snuck love on board. It's a, it's a type of stowaway on this device, which, as I said, may be the final document of our planet, and may be the final example of a distinct human thought, and she may be our representation of human love as it exists in physically in the body, but as she's hoping, who knows, maybe there's a technology that can pull that out in some other, other way. And maybe and this is where art, I think, comes in. The boy, this is, these are some of the images of her tracings that day, uh, you know, as medical data, of course, but the more provocative idea here is are you in there? Are we in that data? Not in a general physiological sense, but are you at the level of individuality in there? It's a much more provocative idea, which I, I love to think about. So if anything were to ever find this, figure out the record player problem, all these other decipherment problems, I'd like to play for you what they would hear, which is, again, the, uh, the audible the electrical signal of a human turned beta audible, representing human love and the hopes that one person hoped it was ever.
that's one hour of, of humans' electricity condensed to 11 seconds, which adds another layer of the second problem. Uh, but somewhere in there, maybe, maybe is the example of what we all know, hopefully know in life, and will continue to know. And I find it wonderful and beautiful, and I'm so glad someone who had the shot to do it took the shot and did it. And she had to think creatively to do that, totally outside the box, but she did it with science and, and the electricity of her body and understanding of physiology and biology that allowed to do it, not, not, not alone the technology that allows it to now break free of the gravitational pull of the sun. And you know, it's right now the Voyager is about right, right there, that, that line. And after 36 years of flight, the front page of the New York Times read, exiting the solar system and fulfilling a dream, NASA craft of all 36 years enters region between the stars. And in this moment, Anne could say that she was literally the only woman whose heart has left the solar system. An incredible thing to even ponder and think about. Maybe the one shot of an internal type of love or heart. Um, and and I, I always want to applaud her for that. And by the way, you know, here's the golden record on the side here. That whole article is amazing. Talking about the accomplishments of that probe. They don't mention the golden record one time in that whole story. It truly is this other little thing that's kind of lost in our in our in our broader cultural narrative, which I really want to argue we should not lose sight of. I have now been this has been instrumental to me as an artist and, and the way I think about science and the way I think they can inform each other. So I want to show you now, we're gonna segue a little bit. Um, and just some of my, my, my own practice as far as what I make, the thinking behind it, but I kind of want that to hover in the background because I'm, I'm gonna circle back to something I'm working on about the history of the heart uh, in a little while. But I've, I've pulled some works from my 20 years now of, of, of being an artist. I've pulled a handful of them that I think may resonate with you in your field. Uh, I'm so curious to hear, to see these works through your eyes because because of your particular insight on it. Um, but I wanted to put up, before I move to that, just a few other questions that pondering the golden record in the story have, has yielded me, and I think keep showing this connection between art and science. Um, the first one's more broad, which I, I hope is broadly what I'm talking about today, about art and science. So the differences and similarities between the poetic and scientific search for the truth what are they? How are they similar? Is something I'm always thinking about. Um, the, what Anne did also to me is challenge the question of what is the biology of, of identity and the physiology of emotions. I've now spent many years trying to really understand the history of that, both pre-science, philosophically, religiously, and then of course around the 19th century, scientists finally have the devices to start studying emotions physio physiologically. And then there's this other thing that, that this seems more philosophical, but also has a direct connection to biology for me, which I'll elaborate on, which is the ethical imperative in remembering. And the Golden Record is this you know, magnificent example of the capacity of long-term human memory and our creativity of how that, what does that look like, what's the device, all those things. But there is an ethics to it as well, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about that. And then something that I also spend a great deal of time on, especially with my interest in exoplanets, uh, uh, origin of life sciences, exo exobiology, all this stuff. I'm really interested at the behavioral level. The possibility of communicating altruistic behavior and empathy across distant time, space, and species. Again, that's essentially what Anne has done. She's provoked this question in a fascinating way. And the field of biological, uh, the biological study of altruistic behavior is a field that I also spend quite a, quite a bit of time studying. So, because this has a bit of, a, I pulled a, I pulled an early work of mine, not so long after my switch from biology and art that I wanted to show you, and a lot of, I want to put this image up because it, I've always been interested in creation stories, creation myths. 
uh, from the Big Bang to, to Genesis. I'm curious about how various ways people have thought have tried to tackle this problem of how did it all begin. And this is an incredible uh, image, from a, a painting here actually in Chicago uh, of the creation of Eve. Y'all sure familiar with this idea is that the woman was made literally from the rib of man in the, in the Old Testament version of this. And so, I, I, as I said, I often have questions to ask myself. And the early question I asked myself is, what if we're, what if that was wrong? And would we accept if we got it backwards culturally? And so I wanted to test it and make a sculpture that potentially would screw up everything, <laughs> just in the way we have large villas in the Western sense have designed how we behave, uh, especially along gender lines. And so this sculpture I made is called Men Are the New Women. And so I, I essentially reversed the process. I, I took, there's a close up of it. I took is a reversal of this basic point that, um, you know, instead of a patriarchy, what if it was a matriarchy? And if tomorrow we dug that bone up archaeologically and told us such a thing, and how that would disrupt everything we know, uh, which is why I, I wanted to ask the question. So a lot of my work, I hope you can start to see it, it's trying to um, use the knowledge of art and science, but in a provocative way to ask these deeper questions about how we define ourselves. And so building off this, I did this whole show where I essentially rebuilt a body with quite significant alterations. And I'll show you one more from that project. Um, so to, just to give you a sense of the scale, there are two human in this relationship. And they are installed at the bottom of the, gra of the ground. And there's a huge concert spotlight hitting them, which is, um, What's going on here? It's a very eerie, kind of ominous looking thing of actually a very delicate uh, process between two people. But what, what I wanted to push at, at a cultural level, it's something I'm really interested in, in this, in a genetic sense, of course, the question of what gets passed down and how and why. But at a cultural level, I'm also fascinated with how do we take forward the emotional, baggage of our parents, for example, uh, just to, to be very precise, which this piece is about. So it's, it was questioning how things are transferred. And so what I, these are made from melted vinyl records, both of the pelvises. The top one is specifically made from my father's rock and roll record collection. Uh, is 12 inch, 33. The top one's made from my mother's high school rock, rock and roll record collection, just specifically her 45s. And my point in this is that I was fascinated. So I'm a huge music person. I'm so fascinated with my parents' generation in the sense that their musical taste could actually instill sin, literally sin, in their bodies by the way they move their bodies. Uh, you all may know the famous case of Elvis not being shown from the waist down and Ed Sullivan. We've kind of lost touch with this in our time with, with what counts as radical music. But just think if the next musical selection you picked, you actually had to contend with that the devil may literally be in that selection. And they were. And I find that fascinating in how a generation had to reassess their own bodies, their own sexuality, the way they move their hips. But there's also, of course, a personal dimension here, which is I know enough about how I personally got here to know the role those very records played in that evening. And I would argue that almost everybody in this room has their birth related to something musical. Some, some, we, we are products of these things as well, right? Even at the level of, you know, there's of course the DNA transfer. But I'm interested if you scale up in that domain and looking at other factors that bring two genetic lines together. And in this case, I'm arguing it's rock and roll. Uh, and the way it's displayed of this last point is just to kind of reveal some of my decision making on you know, the aesthetic side of how do you solve a problem. 
I wanted it. To, I wanted the viewer to feel as if they walked in on two people doing something beautiful. But as now, because of that lens of sin and uh, the, the controversy around rock and roll of the era, that they were now made to feel dirty about it and caught in a sense, which is why they have this harsh concert spotlight on them. So. <clears throat> Okay, so I wanted, I'll fast forward a little. I'm gonna give you a kind of a range of various projects I've done, different topics I, I've tackled, but, I'll, but again, I hope, I hope it um, resonates with some, some of your own thinking. So some other questions I had come up with in my, in my practice are, you know, are there ancient golden records already on our planet, documenting specifically the love and loss of the natural world? Um, and this question I've been pondering a long time, which is, how does one mourn for something never mourned for? Which also seems, I, I think, probably an odd question to, to ask, because how would you do it, and why, why would you need to uh, do it? But I, but I want to tell you the project I did that makes a case for that. So uh, scientists I worked with many years ago, glaciologists, uh, the Waterton Glacier National Park, and I did a series of works, I continue to do a series of works about mass extinction. And what Dan so wonderfully illustrated in my time with them, we went on the glaciers together. But he's, he's, he's this rare classification of science that we argue, oh, a one that's actually growing in numbers, where the thing you started out with in your early life as a scientist, being passionate about, as I said earlier, what gets us to this point. To devote your life to glaciers, you know, of course, it's a particular path to take in life. But he could never have foreseen that during the course of his career, his, his behavior and his study and his, and his emotional content of what he did and the science itself would start to switch to monitoring the demise of the thing he was watching. And it's a very interesting emotional landscape. I'm curious. With, with scientists, when the, they have to contend with the fact that the thing they're studying is likely being pushed out of out of out of uh, reality because of our our species' behavior, and so that made me working with him made me think about this question I, I mentioned about the the natural world and how we mourn for it, and so as as you may know. If, that, that last ice age, a huge number of large animals were pushed to extinction. Environment was, of course, part of it, but there's, there's serious um, consideration about humans' roles in pushing these things to extinction. So that, raised, that raises a field that I'm interested in about preservation and, and ethics of it. And so for many years now, too, I've been studying scientists in this in this domain of long-term preservation of biological material, and what is the ethical imperative to do so? The seed bank, for example, clearly states they're doing this because they assume we're going to have a mass extinction event, and we're going to need a bank of the seeds to restart our agriculture. Uh, so it become, it's an interesting field to me where there becomes this ethical imperative to do the science as well for, for a broad, more broad uh, hope for the for your species, and then also what I'm where I think it may fall into part of part of your your field of interest is of course cloning and the ethical system that started to form around this thinking, which is is largely called restorative justice. And the, the point is that if you know your species caused the mass extinction of another. <coughs> And one day technology allows you to correct for that. Do you not have an ethical responsibility to do so? And many scientists who work in this field would use that logic in this thinking, which is, I mean, the mammoth is going to get cloned someday. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the next 20 years from, from what I, uh, in my own research. But it opens this whole door of ethical issues about how do you weigh the short term, which on paper, that sounds great, yes, we have responsibility, let's do it. But there are a different set of questions that I'm also interested in as an artist. For example, have you not just made the loneliest creature on the planet? 
Uh, and is that not an ethical question to consider? And what does that mean? So I've done a lot of research about the history of loss, also from a scientific level, psychologically, biologically. I just wanted to show you a few of the material references I often use in my work, which I'll, which I'll make uh, circle back to with the mammoth in a second. But I'm, I'm also interested in the material history of the way humans deal with loss. The way the aesthetic decisions they make, the materials they choose, they often are very biological materials, hair, teeth, uh, very uh, blood. People hold on to this, and there's a psychological Uh, braiding hair of the deceased into lockets, hair, this uh, beautiful thing called hair flowers or hair wreaths. So, for example, that hair wreath, as somebody in the family passed away, a locket of their hair would be braided into a little flower and added to the overall uh, bouquet, meaning this is going to take many generations to complete and it is a multi generational commitment to each other. So my idea was, how could I bring the, the, not, the incredible ingenuity and creativity humans have shown in mourning through material items, specifically biological ones? And was it possible to retroactively mourn for all of these creatures that nobody was around to mourn for? Arguably, I mean, of course, humans haven't even developed the system to ethically know right or wrong about their role in perhaps pushing a creature to extinction. But, but my question as an artist is, okay, but now we can, so should I not do that? Um, and so a strange phenomenon of glaciers melting that's not as nearly as widely reported and has deep resonance to long-term storage is that as those glaciers are melting, it is unlocking thousands of tons of material of other creatures. Literally tons of dinosaur bones washing into oceans every day, right now. It is a strange thing of our behavior unlocking our past and our actions that are also buried in that ice in the sense that we push some of these to extinction. There's a whole industry forming around gathering that, that material and selling it to, on the market. Uh, some villages have just completely moved because they can make so much more money selling mammoth husks than fishing that they've just changed to this. It's a strange thing in our time to say that this has become an industry. Uh, the resurrection of lost uh, biological material of the extinct creatures that we like to to extinction and now sell it back into a market. So I made this, this piece. It's called Some Longings Survive a Death. It's very big, it's hard to convey the scale, but these are actually two mammoth tusks, so it gives you a sense of how big it is. But I took, as I said, the craft and aesthetic knowledge humans have now developed over centuries, as far as hair breeding, specifically, and I applied it to the material of these mammoths as they become unlocked. So this is all mammoth hair that has been unearthed along with the bones, and I've applied the techniques of the mourning customs to the, to the hair and made these elaborate wreaths of that biological material. Um, this is another example of a mourning craft tradition, which was to carve often elephant ivory into these little brooches to wear to signify who you had lost. So that's also made uh, carved from ivory. Well, it's hard, maybe hard to tell the detail here, but this is a lot, a lot of detail, a lot of, a lot of work. Um, so because I, I love to ask some questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward a bit and tell you about something that I'm currently working on that hopefully will circle us back uh, to what I started to bring up with Anne. And so one of my projects has been, for Anne specifically, has been what does one gift to the only woman whose heart has left the solar system? This is my, my big poetic question. 
And what in the world could possibly measure up to such a thing? I'm not pretending I'm going to succeed, but I'm going to try. And one of my goals has been, can I give her the entire history of the human quest to record our hearts? And that inevitably becomes a scientific story as well, uh, because we have to develop the technology to do so. So I've been working on this. I've been on the hunt for the very first heartbeat ever recorded. It's truly a beautiful story. I'm not going to go over that one today. But just to give you, I literally want to find where does Anne's narrative begin in the sense that she walked into that room that day, assuming she could record her heart and her brain, as any of us in the room would also assume. But in the grand arc of scientific history, this just happened. It's very recent technology. And we've all kind of lost touch with what that means to record each other's hearts. I don't know if anybody's ever listened to your own heart in the stethoscope, or more importantly, listened to another's. It's so beautiful, and I highly recommend you do it. But in that lineage of these milestones and the quest to record who we are, with maybe that extra hope that is there something else in there that I mentioned, and that's the hope she's she's hoping for. I want to fast forward to a, a very strange question I asked myself, which is. When Anne's heart gets to wherever it's going, which there's no way to know that now, but can we assume our own hearts are still going to sound the same? Again, it's a very weird question, but I want to propose a possible answer to that that's happening right now and could have broad, broad impact on us as a culture. So that, I have spent many years now studying the history of heart transplantation, uh, organ rebuilding, and, and in this case, uh, the history of the artificial heart. And this is the first attempt, this is the first device. We've kind of lost touch with this as well, but it was a game changer. Culturally, and this is one of those cases where science, and what I always argue that a scientist to be aware of how your technology impacts culture in ways you probably can't always see. Um, this completely upended our a human understanding about where we are in our bodies, what does it mean to give your heart to another, you wear your hearts in our sleep, we wear our hearts in our sleeves, we have heart to hearts, centuries of poetry about the heart, there aren't centuries of poetry about the liver or the lungs or the kidneys. My point is that it's hard, it's really wired into us to think about this, maybe metaphorically, but for most of history it was not metaphor, it was literal, that you, who you were was there. And we still do it all the time. And I, would, I like to make people aware of how much we do it every day. Advertisements, pop songs, um, the way we speak to each other, the way we may put our hands on our chest when we're trying to convey something special or authentic. It's an interesting way to, a pathway to study how we became who we are uh, psychologically. Anyway, this technology completely transforms us. And where I, I have many, many fascinating stories to convey about how we have slowly contended with this notion of an of a artificial, a machine art. But it has gone now to some ex uh, logical extreme that I don't think most of us are aware of, and it is amazing. So uh, just to give you one last historical context, and we lose sight of this today, but like with the Apollo program, Everybody remembers, Kennedy very clearly said, we're going to make it to the moon by the end of the decade. We're going to do it, not the Russians. It was totally contextualized in the Cold War way. What's not as widely remembered is that we essentially said the same thing about the heart. We, the U.S. started a total artificial heart program, not unlike the Apollo program. And it was clear we wanted to beat the Russians. And everybody at the time thought, it's just a complicated problem. Surely we can do this. Uh, first attempts began in the early 60s. It's 2018, and we still have not really solved it. And just think if it was 2018, and we still had not made it to the moon. What if the Apollo program was still going right now? Think of what that would mean to us as a nation psychologically. And that's what's happening with the heart. Because, although I find this, I want, of course, I want people's lives to be saved, but at a poetic level, I find it oddly comforting that the heart is so complicated that no one can quite figure out how to make one. 
And you know, we've tried, it's a beautiful history of engineering. It's a, it's a rare case where each engineering adjustment was based on likely the death of the previous person. Think about that as a history of engineering design that is based on the other person dying. Um, but here's the, here's the big problem, is that no matter how hard we try, we just can't figure out how to make a device that pulsate, pulsate, uh, pulsates a million times, let alone, I don't know if you know how many times your heart may beat in your lifetime, three billion. That's incredible efficiency of a device, and nobody can quite know, figure out how to do this. And the analogy of the scientists I'm now working with, the analogy they, the game changer they're putting on the table, and the analogy they often use is that just as we could not quite figure out how to fly by flapping wings, at some point, the engineers of the era had to say, nature solved it one way, but we're gonna solve it another. It led to the fixed wing aerodynamics, which birthed our ability to fly. They're arguing we're at the same point for the heart. And here's, here's the big thing though. What's, what's that? Nature got it one way, let's, get, let's try a different way. It's this. What if you just remove the need of the pulse, 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 pulsations of the beating mechanism? And they have now invented what's called a total uh, beatless, continuous flow artificial heart. This is one of the early de designs, it's, you know, the Archimedes screw. It's, it's basically, rather than using pulses to distribute the blood, can it just be one continuous flow through it? And if you could do that, they argue, they, these, these are the two uh, brilliant scientists uh, and, and cardiac surgeons who are pushing this technology. And they may be completely right, and again, I hope I want people's lives to save, but there's another dimension here, a poetic dimension that I think is equally important that I want to present to you. Here's the side effects of that device. You have no heartbeat, you have no pulse, and you have no EKG. And Mr. Lewis, who was the first to be implanted with it, and he was a flat line on every monitor in the room, completely upended our definitions of death, especially how that's represented in, in medical data. And yet he lived for about five weeks. He was on his deathbed. This is an experimental device that was never meant to save him. And, and we should remember him because, like most people in this field, the patient, the patient level, they're giving their lives for the hope it's going to save others. No guarantee. And actually, we have roughly 60 years saying that it's not quite working, but yet they keep trying. Here's an x-ray of it in his, in his chest. Um, but what I want to propose to you, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, is how art and science need to talk to each other, why they should talk to each other in such moments. Uh, because as I think in your field as well, at some point, not some point, we're already there, we're, we're having to rethink what do we mean by life? What do we mean by, even at the level of a heartbeat, this definition is no longer going to be valid if they're correct. By the way, Dr. Frazier and others don't necessarily think you need to, you should put it in when you're sick. Why don't you put it in before you get sick? <laughs> That's very a whole different question. Because of all the complications that come with heart disease, why not just avoid those early on? So, in a strange way, my question I asked about Anne, what if Anne's heart gets to wherever it's going, hoping to tell a story of what we work? through this very symbolic gesture of our hearts beating. And what if we've all left as a quaint relic of our past, the notion that we needed beating hearts at all? And how is that gonna transform us culturally, emotionally, how we relate to each other one and one? Sorry. But I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna end with a way for us to think about it in an unexpected way. So for, Part of my project of working with these, with Dr. Frazier and others, has been, but what does a viewless heart sound like? Because if they're right, this will be the new condition of how we understand our bodies and as and how we relate to each other. 
So does it mean it's silent? And he told me something really beautiful one day when I was asking him. And he said that it sounded like an empty, windswept landscape, <laughs> which I thought was this like beautifully poetic thing to say about the technology. Although incredibly eerie to think of a windswept landscape now existing at the core of our being and all the poetic connotations of that. Anyway, it took me a few years of, of building a relationship, getting there, we finally, he finally allowed me to record it. And it's one of the most incredible things I've ever heard, and I'd like to play it for you. And just as a little background to the, to it, um, the patient who we recorded it from, again, was on his deathbed. Um, he had not quite been told yet, you know, you have a, you have a, or at least to think through those other dimensions I'm arguing about, what does it mean to have a beautiful heart? So this gentleman um, was one of the now the few humans who's, who have ever had to contend with such a thing. Uh, oh, one little quick thing, but a little side note though, when Mr. Lewis came out of surgery, as did uh, Mr. Carp in the first image I showed you, it's gonna sound silly, but I'm gonna argue to you why it's not. One of the first things their spouses asked them when they came out of surgery was, did they still love them? And sound, maybe sounds silly, and okay, we can chuckle at it, but we really should, because to me, that's a profound question. And if the science has moved on to the brain, fine, but it doesn't mean culturally we have. And it's still an interesting way to think about science through the lived experience of it between humans. So this gentleman that I'm gonna play for, play the recording from, also is contending with this. What does it mean to have a people's heart? Um, I want to play it for you, and then I want to tell you one thing about the recording that's really fascinating. <laughs> Sorry, we got kicked into the wrong room by the producer. 